they all have very impressive resumes, but I'm not going to read their bios. I'm going to just introduce them and allow their bios to come out in their presentations to you. Um, beginning here, we have Reverend Ron Kabata, who is the senior minister of the Buddhist Church of San Francisco. Um, next, we have Rabbi Eric Weiss, uh, who is the president and CEO of the Bay Area Jewish Healing Center. Um, Next, uh, Rabbi Weiss is Sister Sukanya Balsare of the Brahma Kumar, uh, a meditation teacher of the Brahma Kumari's Meditation Center. Um, uh, and then we have our dear friend Fran Johns, who is a prolific writer and a congregant at Calvary Presbyterian Church. And next to uh, Fran is Father Pablo Ivashaivich. Did I get that right? Just call me Pablo. Okay. <laughs> from Argentina, um, who is a chaplain at St. Mary's Hospital, and then our dear friend, uh, and, and one of the co-founders, if you will, of the Interfaith Council with Rita, uh, uh, Iftikhar Hai, who is a hospital chaplain, as well as uh, one of the founding members of United Muslims of America Interfaith Alliance. Um, for the first portion of this program, uh, we're going to have three rounds of questions that I'm going to put to, uh, to the panelists. And I'll ask them to take just a couple of minutes uh, to answer each of them. Uh, something might be said by one of your colleagues that needs further clarification or just sparks something. Uh, I, I would like you to feel comfortable without taking time away from others if you want to do a follow-up question or this is supposed to be a conversation, yes? Yes. So feel free to do that. The second portion is yours. And um, it will be devoted to questions from the floor. Uh, and because you can see we've had to bring chairs in, um, uh, what we've done is we have provided you with question cards, OK? This, um, this, this, gives you, this keeps you from the temptation from making a speech or a sermon. Um, <laughs> and, and it allows you to focus your questions and think about them and if you would write very clearly, I, I, speaking of one who has difficult penmanship, uh, I, I will appreciate if you write very clearly and I, identify either the person you are addressing this to or the entire panel. Um, and so without further ado, are we ready to begin? Ladies and gentlemen, okay. Um, so the first question we'd like to ask is, how does your faith view death, and what happens after death? What customs or rituals are observed? Why are they important? And how do they affect your faith's belief in what happens after death? Is there an afterlife, reincarnation, or is this the final act in a person's life? Ron, would you lead us off? Thank you. Okay, thank you for this wonderful. I have to stand closer. Oh, I mean, sit closer. Okay. I get closer to the mic, and I feel like I'm getting closer to death. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if we could join together, I'd like to begin with this opening meditation. Our religious life should not take pride in philosophy or dogma alone. It should reach into our daily lives to transforming our seemingly independent, isolated, unchanging existence and make it one in the Buddha's great light and compassion. Realizing the truth of interdependency, thereby promoting peace, giving comfort, living responsibly, to be able to give thanks for the blessings of being born into human life. This is our true religious life. Namo Amida Butz, Namo Amida Butz, Namo Amida Butz. I take refuge in the spirit of boundless wisdom and compassion. Have any of you ever heard the joke, why did the Buddhist medical examiner get fired? Anyone? I'm trying to find out who came up with this joke, because I think it's such a neat joke. But why did the Buddhist medical examiner get fired? Because he or she kept writing on the death certificate, 
cause of death, birth. <laughs> so from the moment we are born, we are beginning this process towards what we call die of dying, which will culminate in this experience we refer to as death. That's just how it is for everyone. All existence is finite. But it is because we sense the finite nature of our existence, we are somehow inspired, compelled to generate a response of infinite concern about the meaning of this moment in eternity we call and experience as our human life. So in a way, death is what gives meaning to life because we have to acknowledge we don't exist forever. Again, it inspires, encourages us, compels us to seek that so-called meaning of this brief moment in eternity. We are living as mortal beings. So that, to me, is how religion began. From that sense of understanding, realizing the truth of the meaning of having been born into human life. And the various religious traditions, as I've appreciated them, have been responses to that concern. They've been expressed in different ways, but the essential concern is universal. So I have been telling this story, and that, that's what I see as what we try to do at our churches, our synagogues, our mosques, and so forth, temples, to tell stories, share stories. So that's why I refer to, as an alternate to uh, sermons, sob stories, <laughs> SOB stories, <laughs> that give us a sense of being, stories that give us a sense of being alive. Okay, so this is my story for to begin this evening's discussion. I heard this when I was in Hawaii. I was in Hawaii for 24 years at, a, at our sister temples in the islands, and once I heard from this local guy, this he hear her from his friend, where there was this local guy waiting at the inner island terminal in Honolulu to catch a flight back to Maui. And he's sitting in the lounge there, and he overhears this conversation where one person turns to the next saying, I came to Hawaii to die. Local guy kind of got shook up, and he, so he leaned over to listen to find out what was happening. And then as he listened, he realized that he'd overheard a comment from a New, uh, person that had just arrived from Australia. So coming from Australia, he was speaking with what we call an Australian accent. In other words, what he was saying in our pronunciation, I came to Hawaii today. <laughs> the local guy heard what he heard and the visitor said what he said, but this was not in case of mistranslation, it was misperception. And that's an important thing to consider, how we hear, how we perceive, how we interpret, and recognizing that we are all somewhat conditioned by our cultures, our unique situations, experiences in life that create those filters through which we perceive things, not necessarily as they are, but as we perceive them. So how we hear death definitely, to me, has a different kind of uh, nuance a different kind of interpretation based upon, you know, again, you know, our unique circumstances, experiences of life. And so how I hear and understand this idea, this term we call death from a so-called Buddhist perspective, by the way, I always like to offer disclaimer when I'm ever invited to participate on a panel. I'm here to represent everyone that agrees with me. <laughs> Beyond that, whatever school of Buddhism, whatever religion, whatever tradition you might identify with and the philosophies and teachings accordingly, you know, that's up to you. But whether I'm presenting, you know, a correct 
orthodox, true Buddhist <laughs> explanation of anything. Well, again, that's kind of left to your own judgment from based on your own understanding and appreciation of what you appreciate as the teachings of the Buddha, which are the basis of what we call this religion of Buddhism. But beginning there, Buddhism is a religion of awakening because that's what the term Buddha means. It's a title, awakened one. And historically, we have the history that we're taught about this young man in India or northern India some 2,500 years ago who had this religious awakening such that he impressed people so that began to address him as Buddha, awakened one. And then he was a prince of the Shaka clan, and so there was the other title, Shakamuni Buddha, the sage of the Buddha, uh, Shaka clan. And from what he shared from that awakening, became the basis of what gradually developed throughout Asia as the religion of Buddhism. And it passed through Northern Asia, through Tibet, China, Korea, Japan, and Southern Asia with the spice route that went through Southeast Asian countries. And Buddhism continued to spread in about 100 or so years ago. Uh, Buddhist traditions began to be introduced here in North America. And I'm part of a tradition that's been in San Francisco since 1899, and it came with the Japanese migration. And so that's my background, as <laughs> Michael was trying to suggest we try to in intersect or in incorporate into our comments. But anyway, getting back to that story, in a sense, religiously, we were born to die. The idea of awakening is basically a rebirth, an awareness of immeasurable life that we're all part of. So the basic insight of the Buddha, or the realization, awakening of the Buddha, basically was to what we consider the Dharma, the truth of life. And basically, for me, it boils down to two things. We don't exist forever in permanence. But most importantly, we don't exist alone, interdependence. So the truth that Buddhism focuses on is basically impermanence and interdependence. And so the analogy or metaphor that I appreciate on that basis is to see ourselves as like waves that appear on the surface of an ocean. And the wave appears due to causes and conditions and takes on a form, so to speak. But that form is not static, not stagnant. It's constantly moving. It's flowing. And eventually, again, to causes and conditions, it disappears from the surface. But the source, the essence of the wave is the ocean. And in our tradition, we call that ocean Amida, Buddha, the Buddha of immeasurable light and life. Thank you. Rabbi. Gosh, thank you for kickstarting us. Oh my gosh, I'm so, um, I'm so happy to be here on this panel and so grateful to Michael and the library for convening this, um, this conversation. So um, in Jewish life, um, death and dying have everything to do with life itself. So. I want to tell you a story, and it's a story out of Jewish tradition, and some of you in, in the group may have heard this story before. So it's a story about a guy whose name is Zeusia. That's his name, Zeusia. And he's a famous teacher, and he's on his deathbed, dying. And his students surrounding his deathbed become so agitated that to soothe him, they say to him, Zeusia, please don't be afraid of dying because when you die, surely you will be welcomed by God into heaven just like Moses. And Zeusia is so agitated by this effort to comfort him that he comes out of his death rattle and he sits up in the bed and he says to his students, when I die, God is not going to say to me, how come I was not more like Moses? God is going to say to me, how come I was not more like Zeusia? 
So like all theology, story contains lots and lots of things that you can conjugate out. So by this particular story about somebody dying on their deathbed is really a kind of a story about how to live life. So from a Jewish perspective, every single person is created uniquely in the divine image. I, this is kind of where sort of a theology out there and then a personal reflection kind of intersects. So for myself, um, out of that understanding, I think that um, it is our diversity that is a testament to God's unfathomable creativity. And so by theological construct, we actually are not all the same. We are different by divine intent. And so from a Jewish perspective, everybody really is to live most fully into who they actually really are, and that that is how we die. From a Jewish perspective, when somebody dies, um, in a general way, it's considered that your body actually isn't yours, that it was given to you, and so a body is prepared in a particular way um, for a funeral. There's some variation depending on whether someone chooses cremation or burial, but in a general way, a body is bathed by the community itself in a particular way. A body is clothed in a particular way because one is simply oneself, no matter who was what one was in life. Um, and then, um, in many ways, at a certain point, a funeral, a memorial service, a celebration of life is actually for the mourners. It's actually dictated by grief, not by death. In Jewish tradition, there is a notion of reincarnation and of an afterlife. The, pres the theological presumption is that one goes to heaven. Judaism has a very underdeveloped um, uh, light reference to what what other faith traditions would call hell or something other than heaven. Um, and so in Jewish life, um, in a theological framework, it's presumed everybody goes to heaven. Um, it's presumed that there is afterlife and there's a mystical theological thread of reincarnation. Similar to what Ron said earlier, that doesn't mean that every single Jew believes all of it on any level. So some of you who are Jewish or are maybe Jewish affectionate and know this, there's a tremendous diversity um, theologically and structurally in Jewish life. Um, and one is not required to believe any of these things theologically to yet have the right to um, be a Jew. In Jewish life, one is a Jew by virtue of two things. One, you convert or you are traditionally born from a Jewish mother. There are other threads in Jewish life that say if you have patrilineal descent and other ways of expressing Jewish life, then you are, in fact, Jewish. But in a technical way, one is Jewish by declaration of what you might think of as citizenship, not a, a doxological declaration of faith. You do not have to be um, a Jew who believes in God or even expresses anything religiously to yet claim your Judaism. So I'm a rabbi, I am a man of faith, I do believe in God, and the secular agnostic um, Jewish person next to me is co-equally Jewish. Um, so with that, I will pass the mic back. Thank you again, Janet, Michael, and all the co-members on this panel, and all of you wonderful souls I see in front of me. It's so um, overwhelming to see the room full of people for this very, very interesting, intriguing, and heartfelt topic. So today I am representing the Hindu religion. I am born into that religion. Um, I until I uh, adopted or practiced, started to practice the Brahma Kumari's teaching. Brahma Kumari's is a worldwide spiritual organization which um, 
invites all the religions, all the people of the world um, as part of the same tree of humanity. Speaking of, um, now I switch back to my Hindu roots. Hinduism um, accepts all beings of nature, the whole creation, all people, every aspect of nature as part of God. The one Brahma, the supreme one, the absolute one, the all-pervasive one, the almighty one, formless Brahma. And that's where the notion of namaste comes from, that I bow down in respect to the divine in you, to the godliness in you. Hinduism is a collection of so many traditions, so many beliefs, so many rituals which uh, form the religion. So there is not one standard practice, one standard notion as such, although there are some similarities in all those rituals and understandings um, being followed. Hinduism understands that the body is the dwelling and the soul is the dweller. Body made of the five elements of nature. These five elements get together and give this body to us as a gift. And it stays as property of nature all the time. Just lend it to us for a brief period of time. And the soul, the life energy, the spiritual force, the light dwells in this body, in this particular form, physical form, for a matter of some time. The soul is immortal, the soul lives on. The body gets formed and so it changes its form. It perishes at some point. And the soul continues with its journey further, takes next birth. As the soul goes on with life, it performs actions. And the actions are performed using this body. So it is the soul that is performing karma actions all the time. And the effect of the actions performed stay with the soul, shape the soul, shape the personality of the soul. The soul is the thinker, the soul is the creator of thoughts, the soul is the decision maker, and the soul is the one who, carry, who is carrying out actions. And so the effect of actions go with the soul from life to life. And the soul, this energy with its own choice can change the effect of actions with, there are various ways to carry out more uplifting actions, elevated actions, prayer, devotion, gaining wisdom, opening up one's thoughts, one's heart to the universality of things. And that is how the soul ascends in one's life. The customs and rituals are all based on the divinity present in everything and also coming close to the divinity. Everything is um, considered to be form of God. Even this building, for example, when, the, when a building is constructed, a house is constructed, any dwelling, physical dwelling is constructed, before the family moves in, before the office begins in that dwelling, the God of housing is invoked in that space and asked to reside in that space until the building holds on. 
the deity God is called Vastu Purush. Just to give you an idea. Then the fire god Agni is invoked for purification, for helping the, the devilish, negative atmosphere, spirits to go away from this environment. Then there is water god Varun. So this is just to give you an example that everything has a god deity associated with it, divinity associated with it. And there is also God of Death, Yama. Now, Yama has a assistant, personal assistant with him. And his name is Chitra Gupt. Chitra means image and Gupta means secretly. So he is secretly writing down or creating, painting the image of our karma, of our actions that we are carrying out. And when the time comes close, the assistant Chitra Gupt shows our painting, our painting of karma that he has painted over time to God Yama. And that is how the further journey of the soul, further birth of the soul is finalized or is carved. When the person passes away, it is considered that the soul has left the body just as the birth was the soul entering the body. The soul has left the body, the soul is still around. The soul is living. It is just the body has shut down as the master has left the house. And so this sacred property of nature, the body, has to be given back to nature equally respectfully, equally dig in a dignified way, the way it was received. And so the body is bathed. Usually the cremation rites are carried out within a day, within 24 hours. The body is bathed in front of the house, clothed in a new drapery, very respectfully chanting, prayer goes on all the time as, the, um, as all the rites are carried out. As the body is carried to the crematorium, as if the whole village, the whole town kind of joins the procession because it is considered that one of our family members has passed away. So it is the, the whole town comes together as a family. Usually the body is cremated. Some uh, choose to bury the body, but mostly cremation takes place and the body is again um, worshipped, given all the floral offerings, all the divine offerings and then the pyre is lit. And once the pyre is lit, again chanting, prayer, mantras are going on to help the soul transcend to the new world to the new life. And once everyone stays on the cremation ground all this time and seeing or witnessing the burning pyre helps everyone to process their emotions, to come to a closure and to take on realizing their own responsibility now, from now on, in the family, towards the family, towards the community. When the body is completely burned, completely cremated, the family, members, neighbors, friends, whoever are there around the pyre, they leave the crematorium 
without looking back. That it is all over and we take back the essence of the good qualities this person had with us and to grow them. Once they get back home, the whole house is cleaned, purified, everyone takes a bath and then the food is cooked in the house. For 13 days, the prayers go on. On the 13th day, it is considered, it is a belief that the soul still is connected to the family because of spending this whole lifetime with the family, with that clan. It is not so easy for that soul to leave that family right away in most of the cases. So on the 13th day, a very special prayer is organized. Everyone is invited, close family members, distant contacts, everyone is invited. A simple meal is prepared and a final goodbye is given to the soul. Very happily, very happily. And then all of the household members realize that they have to take on their new duties, their, their new life, even their new life begins as well at that point in time. And so that is how the sacredness of the entire um, ritual, of the entire process of the soul, the departed soul, and the family members still living on. The sacredness, sacredness of everyone is very much preserved, very much intact. And life goes on in a way that is very much connected to the divine as an offering to the divine. Thank you. Thank you. Fran, of all of the panelists here, in particular, you've written books about this topic. Um, and I also would like, just out of respect, because you are in a season of grief yourself, um, to acknowledge that and to offer our love. Thank you. Um, I was, I was going to start um, by explaining that the theological intellectual level of this panel is about to come way down. <laughs> I mean, um, but Michael has already said, I'm here because I'm a writer. I have written a lot about death and dying. And um, this is how not to get invited back to cocktail parties. Um, <laughs> but I, part of my, my I, I wrote a book that came out in 1999 that grew out of my work as a hospice volunteer and with um, an AIDS support group in the 90s and then as a Compassion and Choices volunteer. So I have spent a lot of time uh, being around people with dying, who were dying, and I got into it because I had done mostly volunteer work with uh, arts and historical organizations, and one day I thought, man, I could never be around somebody who was dying, so I think I'll try. And uh, that was when I went to work with hospice, which was the most rewarding thing I have ever done. Um, so from, uh, so Janet asked me to be on this panel. I didn't know what it was, just say yes, because I say yes to things that somebody like Janet asked me to do. Um, and then I found out who else was on the panel and I thought, what in the world am I doing here? So um, I did speak with my pastor because I am a member in more or less good standing of Calvary Presbyterian Church. <laughs> Some days better standing than others. Uh, and, and he said, well, you just tell them what you know, and you probably know as much as the next person. And I said, okay. What I know is there are lines in our, there is one line in a creed that I have said since the time I was tiny that says that I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Well, I don't know about that. 
um, because I'm going to be cremated. I don't see my physical body being resurrected anywhere. But uh, I think what my uh, good minister, Victor Floyd, if you want to know stuff, go talk to Victor Floyd. And I think what he was saying was that um, the beauty of most, uh, or at least Calvary Presbyterian churches, we are still asking the questions. We don't have a lot of the answers, but we are still ask, asking the questions. I have a niece who goes to a Presbyterian church in Atlanta who is very conservative. She will stand you down on the belief that she and my wonderful sister, who has been dead for some years now, will be physically reunited in a heaven that to her is sort of a a place that she can visualize. So uh, as far as what Christians believe, good, well, Pablo is going to tell you more about what Christians mm -hmm. believe. Um, I think it's a, um, it's a matter of look for, uh, we believe in the answers that are in the Bible, but we believe they were written by fallible people, and we believe we should, I at least, I better quit saying we, and say, I feel that I, I need just to keep right on asking questions. Um, so Michael mentioned my good husband of 26 years died uh, just about six weeks ago. It was, and I'll just tell the story because it's, it sort of says how what I believe. Uh, my husband was the son of Methodist preachers, a, a Methodist preacher, um, and he was uh, sort of a classic example of the um, intelligentsia uh, who in the 60s decided that the church was irrelevant and just kind of gave up on that. And unfortunately, the church has done an awful lot to prove them right uh, since then. My husband was a newspaper man, and, and um, so... He would say that he believed in the God of his father. His, he and his father were quite close. And he went to church religiously on Christmas Eve every year. Um, <laughs> he, went, um, he was married to um, a Jewish artist for 19 years. And until she died, they went to Christmas Eve services at Calvary Presbyterian Church every year because they loved the music. And I say, okay, whatever goes. Um, so when he died, um, it was, he had congestive heart failure. I had been around people who had died of congestive heart failure. I knew almost the day it went into end stage. And so I, I did not know that he would be gone in a couple of days. I figured it might take a week or so. So it was very, very fast. I had to fight with the paramedics who wanted to take him to the emergency room and things like that, but I won. Um, I eventually won by saying, okay, you call your head person at San Francisco General. And I got friends at San Francisco General. I was ready to go over this guy's head. But you tell him you've got this little old lady standing here with her husband's um, DNR and his pulse form and his DPOA. And she says, we may not take him out of the apartment. And so they did. And this guy, to his eternal credit, said, fine, get him in bed and leave him there. So uh, the night he died, which was a couple of nights later, it was really quite fast, and he never had pain. He never had real discomfort. Um, I was telling Pablo, thank you for that first name thing, um, that we had a friend who we had very close friends who just had their first baby, and the baby was born eight weeks premature, but it has grown now from two pounds to about, I think it was about six or eight by then. They brought the baby over, flumped him on my husband's chest, and my husband was by now totally nonverbal, but still sort of uh, responsive. And so he reaches up and makes these this sort of patting the baby gesture. It was so dear. 
And then they left, and I climbed in the hospital bed and hugged him into the hereafter. And we should all go this way. Um, so my looking back at that, um, the questions about how my faith uh, impacts my own uh, feelings, I feel, and I think my husband felt, comfortable that um, he was more comfortable with the, I believe, the fact that he had, had led a, a good life. The man was the most honest and ethical person I have ever known in my life. And I think he, you know, he knew he had lived his life doing right. Um, I often tell people, I was telling Sister Sukanya, uh, that I could be a Brahma Kumari because Brahma Kumaris believe, and she told me I was right on this, that all religions are valid, that we are branches of the same tree. So uh, now I'm not sure how uh, Chitra Goop Chitra Goop would be painting my picture. This I, I got to talk to you about that, um, but um, I am. Uh, perfectly comfortable with the belief that when my soul leaves this body, I hope it's not tomorrow, but if it's tomorrow, it'd be okay, because I am perfectly comfortable with the belief that I will be a part of God's universe somehow. Um, my husband was cremated. I'm going to be cremated. Half of his ashes Go. I have to go to St. Helena and scrubble them on his first wife's grave, which I think is kind of nice. I mean, they had a, apparently a really good marriage. Um, and then the other half is going to go and be mixed in with my ashes, hopefully not tomorrow. Um, and, I, and those are going into half into the Chesapeake Bay where I grew up and half into the San Francisco Bay. And don't tell the authorities, but I have to have a handful in Mountain Lake because I love Mountain Lake Park. So this, to me, um, is a comfortable feeling. And I think it uh, is probably not very uh, theologically uh, profound as far as Christianity goes, but it works for me. And I think that's what's mostly important about looking at your own death and dying. Thank you, Fran. And thank you for representing a part of Christianity, <laughs> which is not small. Okay. Um, Father Pablo, how do you follow that? I, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I would like to say the, f the first thing is very, uh, actually it's a privilege to be almost the last one. Uh, and not to have your duty to start. And as a privilege because um, perhaps many of the things I could say uh, will be redundant because somebody else already mentioned them, you know? Uh, so you will see that about dead and dying and life, there are many commonalities, very th many things, you know, that we have in common. And we don't realize that. Now, um, when we talk about death, what type of death are we talking about? Most of the times we are talking about the physical death. You know, and we are afraid of that. I'm afraid of that. I mean, you know, thinking about physical death, suffering, all of that. I'm a chaplain, um, besides being a priest, so on an average, I perhaps can say that uh, at the hospital I see three to four people dying a week. So I was sharing with my riders, you know, with, I'm sorry, your name, I always, sister. see, with sister, I was going to say sister, but just in case, you know, because, and then, and, and, and my driver, Janet, over there, I was sharing with them, you know, most of the times I'm exposed to that, and that influenced me a lot. And I need to find a spiritual practice or something to perhaps, decompress, rest, because that leaves um, a big mark on your soul. Now, talking about that, we were created to life eternal. 
okay? Uh, dead, I'm talking as a Christian. As Ron said, the first one, I'm talking about my own beliefs. I'm not imposing on you. And I also have a dichotomy to deal with here because I'm also a chaplain. So let's clarify that part. As a chaplain, when I walk into a room, I can walk into sister's room, uh, Rabbi Wise's room, your room, my friend here's room, and Ron's room, and I am not there to proselytize or impose my own beliefs. I am there to walk alongside that person's suffering or existence or beliefs. Now, I will share with that person what my beliefs are, I will inform that person who I am when I walk into a room, especially if they are dying or asking some questions, because they have to know who, who they are dealing with, but I'm not there to convince them of anything. Okay, so sometimes people don't understand what chaplains do, and this is the same thing they do in the armed forces and anywhere else. Chaplains are not allowed to proselytize. Now, if somebody asks you to be baptized or to know more about your faith or would like to become Jewish, then, okay, let's talk. You share with them. Okay, but we are there to walk along, to, con you know, some things they will use in some. So, con suffering love, you know, walking along somebody, compassion. But I like to say con suffering love for whatever reason because it's more understand for me, you know. So, you walk along somebody else's suffering or path in life. So let's go back. God did not create death. We were created, one more time talking as a Christian, we are created to life eternal. When we're talking about death, we are talking about the death of the body. Death is a result of rebellion against God, um, for not listening, obedience, perhaps. We were allowed to use and touch any tree in, the para in paradise, but we were taught, you can eat any apple, any apple. Just don't touch the ones from that tree. And we decided to do it. By the way, to make you laugh a little bit, you know, somebody asked me with the church on divorce, and he said that first divorce and separation took place in paradise. And we blame God for it and say, why? Well, because, you know, he answered to God. He said, what you did? Why you did this? The woman that you gave me, she made me do that. And I say, that's the first one, you know? Anyway, so that's where it comes from. You know, we were created to live eternally, and our bodies die. Our body is supposed to go back to Earth from where we came. At the moment of death, uh, the separation between the body and soul takes place, uh, which we have many rituals for that commendation. We even have a ritual, a special ritual for people who have difficulties dying, you know, to help them pass. And uh, what happened with the, the body? Well, the body goes back to the earth, it decomposes, and it waits for the last judgment, most people would like to call it, on call, you know, the second coming of Christ. And at that moment, we'll be called back, no matter if you were cremated or not cremated. You know, answer a little bit to your question. Shall somehow, miraculously, will be transformed, become a new body, and reunited with that immortal soul. What happens with that soul in between the moment of death and the resurrection or the transfiguration on transformation? Well, that's the big question. Um, what happened is, I guess, if for we here on this earth, we choose perhaps not to be a good person or to be evil, and that's also a, another type of discussion, what means to be evil or not a good person, but what we generally understand, no? Will we be close, perhaps will we be closer or farther away from God, no? Until that moment takes place. I think one of the problems we as Christians have that we think that we can manipulate God, sometimes through our rituals, and I ask anybody to correct me later or here sitting with me. So we say, well, if I give you this, you give me that. Come on, can you, can you do that to God? <laughs> Come on. And then another thing that people don't understand, I think, you know, when we think about God's mercy, 
and God's immense love for all of us, which some of my you know, fellow panelists have mentioned that before. God's mercy is alpha and omega. doesn't have a beginning and an end. You know, our sins in front of that mercy all, I don't know how to measure them. So uh, if we, uh, you know, offer repentance, change to God, um, it's said that there is only one sin that cannot be forgiven. And that sin is that we make, when we make our own persons, our egos, our bigger than God's mercy. You know, uh, we have to think about a merciful God. And when people talk about the fear of God, uh, uh, you know, we don't have to be afraid of God because he will be coming behind us with a big stick, you know, and make us read uh, 100 Our Fathers and 55,000 Hail Marys. Uh, God doesn't do that. Uh, we men do that, you know. We make them do that. We make people do that. Uh, we had to be afraid of harming God because he's a loving God. He loves us. We should give him love back. And if we are going to do evil and be wrongdoers, we have to be afraid of harming him. That's the fear of God, being afraid of harming somebody that you know we love. Uh, we have, I don't know if I answer some of the questions, but many things were answered by my co-panelists here. Another thing I am against it a lot, people try to avoid bringing children to funerals. I think that's one of the greatest mistakes that we, because death is part of life. Look at the flower. If a flower doesn't die or a tree doesn't die or the apple from Adam and Eve's tree doesn't die, then we will not have a new apple tree. Gene and tech or not gene and tech involved. You know, we need something to die, you know, or Monsanto. Uh, you know, we, it has to die. It has to die in order to be recreated. And if children are not exposed to that, then we have a problem. I, as a chaplain, have a problem. I don't know if you guys experience, some of you here, uh, that I don't know if you have physicians in this, uh, and I don't have, you don't have to raise your hands if you are physicians. But physicians have a problem with um, death because they're fixers. And they had to fix the issue. And sometimes they will call the chaplain or somebody else, or perhaps, because by law has to be done by a physician, they will call a resident to call the family and let them know that X and X is about or will die or they would ask the chaplain to do it because it's very difficult to communicate that. We approach, and this is very important why we are here today, we approach the topic of death very late in life, many times. Uh, we approach the topic of palliative care or hospice very late when it should be approached earlier in life. And um, we have, well, rituals, we have many rituals. You know, we prepare the person for that. Uh, uh, through the prayers. We, certainly we have the funerals, we have memorials, we have memorial meals. Um, but um, the most important part, I think, as a Christians, is that we have to try not to be afraid of death. Uh, death is part of life. And to add in a personal note, very, very recently my mother passed. On February 6th, February 4 was her birthday. So I ha my brother calls me, and I had to take a plane and fly to Buenos Aires, Argentina. I flew, I, after service on Sunday, I got there on Monday morning, straight from the airport. We went to the hospital, the bedside. Mom said that she didn't want any kind of, uh, she called them pipes. You know, any, anything, just she has some oxygen and a little bit of morphine because they supposed she was in pain. That's another interesting question. And then, and then, so she was calm, very, very calm. I spent like around eight hours with her and with my brother, but he understand my needs, you know, being far away. And then the next day, uh, you know, we sing uh, with her. 
And then we went back home. We had we bought a bottle of the Fairmont champagne, and we learned it was quite expensive. And then we enjoyed with my brother singing songs that she will like. And then uh, the next day we went to the hospital a little later. On the third day, when she passed, she passed on the sixth. She was 89. Uh, we uh, we were about to go. We get a phone call. Mom passed. On the fifth, we were able, together, we gave her the sacrament of the sick, the anointing of the sick, preparing her for that. Okay? That's another question. We had to look at that as not the extreme unction. You know, it's not something that you do, because sometimes somebody sees clergy, not only a priest, walking into a room, and they say, <gasps> did the doctor forgot to say something? You know, no. You know? Uh, mainly we try to bring you life. But that's what we did, and then she passed. You know, my friends, uh, it's interesting. A lot of people came to us, and they wanted us to have this tragic, depressed, dramatic uh, attitude towards what happened. We did not. We were very calm. We were laughing, I and mean, not, not making fun of the situation. And one thing, we took my mom together with us in a car, a big van. So we were driving. I didn't know I could have that here, you know, some pictures. But you could see the coffin on our side here. We drove 1,250 plus kilometers up northeast from Buenos Aires, near to maybe you have been at this wonderful place, the Iguazu Falls, up northeast of, in the border with Brazil, around there where she wanted to be buried. Uh, was not scary at all, was calm, was pleasant, actually was our last trip with mom. And uh, we buried her, so we tr just try not to be afraid of, of that, you know? And we can talk more a little later. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Father. Before we get to Iftikhar, who's going to always get the last word, um, if you have questions, can you just raise them uh, the, in your, if you have the cards? And Janet, would, would you send somebody around, or perhaps you can help us uh, collect these cards? Um, thank you. Iftikhar, when I get calls at the Interfaith Council, we need a chaplain, a Muslim family uh, is, is in need of a chaplain because of an end-of-life issue, I call my friend Iftikhar. I call him not only because he understands the Muslim faith, but because of the many people I've met in this life, he brings his faith in his compassion to others. And so, Iftikhar, if you can take just a few moments to talk to us about this perspective that you've heard down the table from the Muslim faith perspective. Well, thank you very much. Well, I'm glad I'm last, because Islam came last. Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, right? They all preceded Islam. So Islam is just 1,435 years ago. So it is the youngest religion. And what happened is that we Muslim, we copy from whatever preceded before. Why? Because the Quran says, you know, there's a book, the Quran, right? That to every people, God sent messengers in their own language, in their own country to clarify. So, you know, when that message came to me, I was never raised in a religious tradition. But, I mean, I have passed this thing on to everybody on their seat if you have this. So, I mean, if you can, can take a look at that, and especially on the second page, I mean, that's why, I mean, we've learned a lot from the tradition of the Jewish people, you know, the belief in one God, and then not eating pork, and circumcision. We learned this thing from the Jewish tradition, because Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are Arabian religions. They started from the Middle East. And I happen to be born in India, out of Hindu-Muslim parents. So, I mean, I cannot ignore, I cannot forget my Hindu roots also. 
because if I have accepted religion of Islam, that doesn't mean that it had Hindu roots to precede me. And so I'm, I'm trying to be inclusive of all religions in order to learn the best from all faiths, really. And because it's a blessing for me not to have been trained traditionally or conservatively in Islamic faith from any religious scholar, I can, I can pick up the, the Bible and read myself. I can read from the, from, the, from the Jewish tradition and from the Hindu and also from the Quran. This is what I've been doing all my 50 years of living in this country. I'm in this, in this country 50 years now. Yeah, so, so you know, uh, so I, I'm not going to talk much about it because I'd like to open up a question and answer. But I mean, these are the two pages that I left, right? So if you can have this and take home, and if you want to ask any question, I'll be happy to answer it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Iftikhar. Economy of words. Um, I just want to let you know, I, I must be a weak moderator because I did not have the heart to cut anybody off. We, have, we had other questions to ask, but I realized as we were about halfway through that we were addressing just what the topic asked us. How do different faiths, traditions view death? And you were very successful in each one of your responses. I do want to thank the person who asked this question in particular because it was one of the questions we were going to ask anyway. And it is addressed to all of the panelists. And so we can get, I know we're not going to get to all of these questions. We might not get to many of these questions. But this is an important one. Can all the panelists address how their faith feels or permits people to use the End of Life Option Act, Physician Assisted Suicide? Who would like to start? <laughs> Fran. <laughs> because I invested about 10 years of my life in getting that act passed. Um, and um, as far as my understanding of Christianity, it does, there's, I don't find anywhere in the Bible that says you really have to suffer. And the End of Life Option Act, uh, which has really more protections than I wanted in it, um, all it does is say to a terminally ill, mentally competent adult, you don't have to suffer. And if I, 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 I'm not worried at all about death, but as I think it was Pablo said, I, I don't do pain well at all. So if I am terminally ill and mentally competent, that's always a question, um, I, w I am very, very grateful that I will have the right to ask my physician to uh, give me life-ending medication. Thank you. And not everybody has to answer it, but those who would like to step forward, because we do have some other questions here, but if there's others that would like to address this. Well, I'll just, oh, no, no, no. Well, I'll just add this way that each case is a particular case. I have seen some Muslims say, do not put me on life support at all. So we follow their will. And in some cases, in case of an accident, there was an Afghani man. He had so many tubes over there. His wife kept on saying that, no, keep him alive, you know. So there, there are cases of, of both kinds. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Thank you. Rabbi. So... Um, I care a lot about this issue from a perspective that might be a little different. So I just want to add to this. Um, when, when we come to die, for lots of reasons, um, I'll just say if somebody comes to you and says, how are you feeling? They know you're sick. How are you doing? Typically, and I'm kind of being reductionist just to make the point. Typically, the response has a lot to do with the medical narrative. I went to the doctor. My tests are X or Y or Z. My treatment options are X or Y or Z. I had a really bad time with the chemotherapy, on and on and on. Or the answer might be in the legal narrative. I went to my attorney. I needed to do an advanced health care health directive, et cetera, et cetera. So both of those things are really important. We know that. But 
the undercurrent of all of that is really the spiritual narrative. And really, what is it about wanting to come to a point at which you might think, this is going to be my last breath? Or this is where I'm tired of X. Or this is where my line in the sand is. So my deepest hope, actually, is actually now that we have this law and all this effort was put into lobbying and um, crafting the law and all the different ways in which civically this law exists, which I think personally is fine, actually. Um, and at the Barrier Jewish Healing Center, we work with people who are ill, dying, and bereaved. That's our entire structural service. We provide Jewish spiritual care to people who are ill, dying, and bereaved, and people in our world have utilized this act. But this is my greatest hope, is that um, we don't stay on just wondering whether or not it's okay theologically, but that we really, really now take the opportunity to go uh, just deeper into the humanity of it, into the self-reflection of it, whether you want to call yourself theological, religious, or spiritual, every single one of us wonders if or what is beyond me. What, if anything, might be after my last breath? So to me, that this law exists really um, invites us, I hope, really civically to get into the depth of that conversation. Because I think that's the conversation that matters. Uh, well, um, priest. So we have a little problem with the uh, uh, question. You know, the, the wording also, the law, you know, is talking about suicide. Uh, because, and at the beginning when I started, they say, remember sin, repentance? Well, somebody said, you know, a suicide is a perfect crime because you cannot catch and put whoever kill whoever in jail um, or punish or whatever you know and there is no way that I understand okay you know of repentance say okay will this happen how you how you say you know how exonerate now the the, the thing that I wanted to say first when I was listening is that of course we talk about it first of all you know in Catholic hospitals or others uh, or hospital of religious uh, background or founded by religious, this is uh, by the hospital, by laws, not allowed, but respected. Uh, like somebody will come and ask in the ER for an abortion. So we will organize everything and find somebody and transfer that person to another place. And actually will be paid by us, the transfer, all of that. But under the roof of a Catholic institution or a Christian hospital cannot take place. Now, uh, at St. Mary's, I have been uh, around 17 plus years or something like that, I don't know. I have to sh say to you, I don't know if you talk with doctors about it, many doctors uh, will say most of the doctors that I spoke to, and they're not Catholic doctors, they're Jewish doctors, others, they have a problem with that when it came, that was, you know, our discussions were about it because they say, I'm here to, to do completely the opposite. So we will go back and say, well, you are uh, fulfilling the wishes of the person. You have to prescribe that and they have to do it. And, and um, they had, a, you know, a problem being a doctor to heal and then to do this in order to allow somebody to die. And that has to do also with the, what we were saying before, they have a problem with death because they are fixers. Uh, now is the person doing it, it's not the doctor doing it. The person has to be able to do it and it's very, very complicated to get it because the person has to be, I mean, they screen that person. They will take you to a doctor, uh, to the uh, to a psychiatrist. I mean, you have to pass a whole bunch of evaluations to be able to to do it. So it's not that simple. I want a pill, you know. No, it's not just like that. It's a very complicated issue. But in my experience, most doctors that I spoke with uh, from different religious backgrounds, they had you know a problem grasping that that idea. And that's part of what we say. It's something new. I mean, it, it's something completely new, you know. That's 
just, if I can just put one PS on there, this is a reason not to go to the hospital to die. Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, um, we don't all have uh, a little old lady like me standing there saying, do not take him out of this house. S but we do have the right to set up DNRs and pulse and other forms. And, and I, my personal advance directive includes a clause that says, if I am unable to feed myself, I demand not to be fed. So if I get really bad dementia, I'm not going to be around that long because as soon as I can't feed myself, I will begin to die, which is what we all do. That was, uh, I just needed it, to put uh, that PS on there. I, it, anybody who has not spoken uh, and would like to, and then we'll come back to your father, okay? Uh, father? <laughs> no, I, but I do. I am also the notary for St. Mary's. So I do advanced directives and an average of five a day. And that's a way around it. You know, it's true. I mean, the hospital is very interesting because there is a contradiction in this law. Okay, you bring this law, but it's in the hospital, so we cannot do it. What do you do with it? I mean, but some people don't understand. You can make an advance directive, and the physicians has to abide according to that legal document. And that's it, you know? And very few people have the advance directive. I want to share with you, I tell you, ask you, plea with you, please do it now, as soon as possible. That doesn't mean that you're going to die, as you were saying, tomorrow. And I, w I have a question for you, who is going to take the ashes from here to there? That's a big question. <laughs> but, but, but no, you have to prepare the advance directive now, as soon as possible. Don't wait and assign your agent and keep that communication with your agent alive, the person who is going to answer for you. Because most of the times, do you know, even to the panelists, these questions, when do they call me to prepare an advance directive? Or five minutes before they go into the OR. How you want me to do, son? I have a colleague, Father Michael Greenwell. He's a chaplain there. He would call it, this is a sacred document. I mean, you have to think about it. You cannot do it just five minutes before. So do it as soon as possible. And then we have to respect your wishes. Thank you. Did you want to say who is going to spread your ashes? <laughs> well, yeah, my children. I left them money to have a party. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a, a thank you to the person who asked this question that I'm about to ask because it was yet another one of the questions that we wanted to ask previously. You all are invited into hospital rooms, not because you have theological degrees or you're theologians, but because you offer spiritual care and you are invited into these most sacred moments. That said, the question here is, how do you guide people to a sense of closure and reconciliation before people pass? An easy question. <laughs> I, I just climbed in the hospital bed and hugged him. Okay. I don't think you have to do anything else. Rabbi? <laughs> They haven't spoken yet. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I don't mean to be controversial in this way, but you know, it's not possible in a lot of ways. People, you know, um, we all have a journey, and we all come to a point at which we have closure enough, um, or we all come to a point where we have reconciliation enough. Um, I think, s now, it's not to say that some of us don't get to die with complete and total reconciliation to our entire lives, and it doesn't mean that some people don't get to have complete and total closure for their entire lives. If you do, I mean, none of us are have died yet, so we don't know, but if you do, you're really, really lucky. Because most of us do die with kind of an if only, or I wish. Now, it could be big, or it could be small. So I think, and I don't mean any disrespect to the question, because it's a typical question, 
And part of the part of this our challenge is that we don't have great vocabulary as we do with other things in the world on this topic that gives us nuance and understanding that's just true so far. So I would just say it's not to be Pollyannish about it. We really do die until we do live until we die. And when we die, we die at the point at which we've lived life. And of course, a ton of stuff has been reconciled. Of course, a ton of stuff has been closed or you've turned a page. And of course, at the same time, it hasn't. So that just really is the core human nature of a last breath. So I think if we don't go in intending to make sure that somebody gets to die with closure, with, with reconciliation, we actually are more successful in helping them to die and to die more easily. Ron? We tend to separate mentally, intellectually, beginning, end, and make these distinctions. And so there's this notion that death is an end. It's a change. And so, as I'm reflecting on this question, the process in our my sense of it is we talk about, we entrust ourselves to what we call Amida Buddha, the spirit of boundless wisdom and compassion who calls to us and say, come just as you are with your baggage, with your regrets. And we're born, reborn, so to speak, in the pure land. That's the theology or the, the uh, philosophy where the conditions are such that all of that stuff will be resolved. But then we don't stay there because in the moment of our so-called spiritual liberation, awakening, becoming Buddhas, we are naturally drawn back to this realm to guide others. So that's my response is how you die at the minute, moment of your physical death is due to your own unique circumstances. But that's the spirit, or that's the situation for which the spirit of love, compassion, embraces us just as we are, and thereby transforms us into the oneness of boundless wisdom and compassion. And that is how I appreciate this sense of death is not an end. It's a change. And life is change. That's the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> Entropy. <laughs> Everything changes, folks. Whether you accept it or not, that's just how it is for all of us. But so the question is not how and what happens after we die. It's to focus on how we are living, how we are receiving this moment in eternity as an opportunity for awakening to the truth of our oneness. And yeah. from there, realize the gratitude and joy of being each of us just as we are. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you both for these responses because I'm reminded of that book. It was by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, where she talked about the stages of death um, and I think, were there seven of them? I don't remember. But she said, they don't come in any particular order. And they might not get to all of them. And, and death is as messy as life. And, um, and so thank you for giving clarity. Did anybody else want to take up that question? Yes, sister. We have, we condition our minds to see birth as one event and to see death as another event. But if we look at life, we are in each moment, we are dying to this moment and taking rebirth in the next moment. And so not to wait for that event, death, that we picturize in our minds to um, for a few moments before that to reconcile, to talk about stuff, to bring some things to a closure. 
but to use the opportunity of each moment to just clarify things, just clarify misunderstandings. And I remember that doing with my mother and my father, um, last year I was with them. I remember um, my mother just had her hip replaced and I had, I was working at that time and I had to report back to the office, to my office in two days, within two days. And I, even now it, the picture comes to my mind, my mother was lying there in the bed, immobile. The help wasn't there in place as of now. And I said, mother, I'm leaving. And I could not come to terms with it for so many years that I just left my mother lying there in the bed in pain just two days after her surgery, no help there. And it just bothered me on and on and on. And finally, last year after I think how many years, 10, 15 years, I said to I clarified this with her that, Mom, I really feel so bad. I wish I should be dead now as I'm speaking to you this. And she said she was um, very happy I opened up. And she said it was OK. It was perfect. We call it um, the story that is going on, the story that we are all living right now. She said it was perfect in the story. And it all happened. It was, it is past now. And so move on. <laughs> and so that was very healing for the soul, very healing for the soul. And with my father, who is now going through last stages of Parkinsonism, he can hardly communicate. And I have things to talk to him too, but there is no communication now that can happen. And so I see him as a living being, as a living soul, and I just talk to him um, thought to thought. And I'm sure the soul gets it, the soul is listening to it, and I am getting freer and freer each time I have that conversation. And so uh, not to wait for that event called death, or when we see that event coming closer, but to use each moment and live a life of freedom, of liberation, and give that gift to everyone and to yourself. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for just a couple more questions. Um, and there is one in particular, only because you all somehow in your responses talked about in, especially when it came to the rituals, the reverence for the body, and, and, and how it is treated. Um, after uh, death occurs, this person asks an interesting question. How do the various traditions view the practice of donating the body to science after death, in light of everything you've just said? An easy question. <laughs> Iftikhar. You know, scholars in the United States, they differ from scholars back home. In the United States, the scholars who came from all over the Muslim world, they say it's OK to donate your body parts so that other people can live. So there is no, I mean, back home, it is a different interpretation. But in the United States, this is the interpretation. I think, I think it's OK. I hope it's OK, because my driver's license says, whatever you can use, use. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> but uh, as far as leaving your body to science, uh, bless the people who already have, yeah. where would science be? So if uh, anything in Christianity has a problem with that, I'm going to have to go talk to them. And, and thank you, because that's the first time I've heard the Division of Motor Vehicles get a compliment. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Now, uh, what I, what I, I, it's very simple, I think. What is the highest form of love? You know, if you go to John, St. John, the apostle, he says, to give your life for your neighbor, mm. you know? So uh, I guess, you know, that's, that's my answer, you know? Giving your life for your neighbor. Uh, I, I don't see a problem. Many people will have problems. 
Sam, that's the saying that when we are walking into somebody else's room, you know, Rabbi, you said it, Ron said it, we had that is nine. We had to be careful not to project our own hopes mm -hmm. on that person believes, because we may practice Judaism in one way or Hinduism in one way or this way, and they may not. You know, we expect we want them to repent for this and that, and they don't need to do that. So we have to be careful what we are doing. But the gift of love is the highest gift. It is, it is a personal choice, and um, that choice would depend on how you have cultivated your relationship with your body. If you see your body as the gift of God, you want to pass on this gift to others, do that. Some people um, have the belief that, no, this entire body should go back to God, to the divine as it came. And so they do not choose to uh, go that way. But it is entirely personal. And how do you view your body as? Um, from, a, from a Jewish perspective, both um, donating your body to science and organ donation are fine uh, for, for similar theological reasons. As far as I know, Buddhism doesn't have any particular positions on this issue because 2,600 years ago, it was an option. <laughs> so uh, that's for me what I take from the previous discussion about the End of Life Option Act. It's an option because medical science has developed the means to do these things. And so, as far as I understand, you know, from the so-called Buddhist perspective, because generally, you know, there is a cremation, is a general approach, and th that's culturally influenced. It's not a so-called religious determination. So these are the things that are always changing. <laughs> Everything's always changing. Our perspectives change. Our values change, so to speak. And then this option of uh, donor, you know, organ don donations. I have it on my license plate, but that's my option. It's not the church's position to tell anybody what their options should be, because they're options, not obligations. Thank you. We're going to close with this question. Um, and uh, again, I, I thanked every person who's asked a question, so I'm going to thank this person for bringing us to a close. Um, and it's a deeply personal question for each of you. Are you afraid of dying? Why or why not? And how does your faith inform this? By all means. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, when I pass this on, it is the first thing that I said over there. He says, death is end of physical life on earth, but also the beginning of new life under God. Mat matter dies, but the soul lives. Personally, I do not fear death. The only thing I fear is the physical pain that is associated with death in this world. Thank you. I ascribe to many of these things. He said, uh, there, am I afraid of time? When once I was very sick, um, I was in South America, a doctor came to me and said, Pablo, you have to take it down. If not, the next time I come to you, I, it will be at your funeral. <laughs> yeah, that he said that to me, it's literally. So I started taking care of myself, and I started preparing more spiritually uh, to meet with my maker. So I guess my answer to that, me, will be to try to make my relationship with the divine, develop it more with God, become closer. And as when we become closer to God, then we uh, stop being afraid of that transition into a new life of being dead. Because it's like, you know, they said in the Old Testament, and others, you know, he, he or that person, he didn't die. He kept walking and kept walking together with the Lord into paradise. It was not painful, nothing difficult. So that, uh, that's my answer. Am I afraid? 
I don't think I'm ready yet, but he knows better. <laughs> uh, and I, I think I've already said, I'm, I'm not afraid of death. I am afraid of pain. Um, and I do have a theological reason, I think, for, and it is because I hear from my pastors and I read in the Bible that God loves me anyway. It's that I am okay, I am loved by God, not for anything I have done, but because God loves me. That makes me feel like um, she, excuse me, is uh, going to just welcome me into the hereafter. Okay. Am I afraid of dying? I think I am ready. It can come. I am. I will welcome it any moment, even if it is the next one. I, um, whenever this question comes to me, I am a firm believer in my own actions, and I believe that whatever I have put out is what I will experience. And so I ask myself, have you given sorrow to anyone? Have you given pain to anyone? No. And so it will not come to you. Have you um, thought ill about anyone? No. So no one is going to harm you. And so I am. Um, I feel very, very free, very, very ready, and just any time, ever ready, <laughs> but very much um, observant of my own actions each moment. Thank you. Um, so I, personally, I'm not afraid of death. Um, uh, although similar to what, what people have said, at least for me, more recently, I've been finding myself just kind of naturally thinking more deeply and anew about this notion about being ready for death. So this notion of readiness is just kind of something I'm returning to because to me it's become way more vague than I used to feel sure of, but I'm not in and of itself afraid of death. I don't want it to happen t tonight, but, um, but I do hope that I do hope if I have any level of control or whatever happens that I just die in my sleep. That's kind of what I hope for. I think most of us do. Um, and from a faith perspective, I guess, I guess in that way, the core of what sustains me is I just believe that I'm not alone in the world. So that sort of buoys me. So I don't think... Uh the fear of death is as much of a concern for me. It's rather fearing life. So to not fear coming alive. And for me, alive, and people from our, our temple get tired, but I use all these acronyms. <laughs> but alive is aware, loving, inspired, valued, engaged. So our religious life is to come alive. And fearing death is not such a, not right now an issue for me because it's not something I necessarily have to do. <laughs> it's done for me. So I just entrust myself to life and to enjoy the moment. And thank you all for sharing this moment. Thank you to the panel. You know, um, I've been asking all of the questions tonight. This last question, if you'll permit me, I'd like to answer. Um, I, I've been in an interesting situation where uh, just November, um, my mother passed. But five years ago on Christmas Eve, my dad passed. And in each of these cases, I was with my brother at their bedsides. In the case of my father, uh, I had been, he was on the East Coast and I was on the West Coast, so I didn't see him a lot. Um, but I was called back. He called me back because he wanted to be removed from a lot of tubes 
that he could not live with out. And I found myself at his bedside on Christmas Eve saying things that I never anticipated saying. The I love yous, the I'm sorry's, the I'll take care of mom, the things that I needed. So in death, he taught me how to live and gave me some closure and reconciliation. Um, and I also was inspired by his own faith, a faith that, that he took with him into the next life. And I think as I, I'm getting a little bit older, um, I'm figuring some of this stuff out and the fear is less um, because I'm starting to live a little more. And so with that, I just want to say a very special thank you to each one of our panelists. Uh, you, you, you created a mosaic tonight that I'm sure uh, left impressions upon those in the audience. I want to thank the audience for, for your questions and I apologize if we didn't get to all of them because in about one minute, uh, we're going to be asked uh, to bring things to a close uh, so that they can turn the lights out here. Um, a different kind of closure. Um, but before we do that, um, I really would like to uh, say a thank you to the San Francisco Public Library, and in particular to Janet Tom for this invitation. And Janet asked me to remind you all, since you got a, a little taste of it tonight, that the third uh, in the series, Program 3, will take place on May 7th. And it's all about the Gift of Life Option Act. So, it, so if you got a taste of it tonight, you'll, you'll hear it ad nauseum on May 7th. Thank you all very much.